This is uh, the next session chair is Klaus uh, Svensson from the UK CEH, and I'm very happy that we can welcome you here today. I heard your voice already. Uh, thanks for joining. Um, and we're going to look now into data fairness, data um, metadata. Um, the floor is yours. I would also just like to point your attention to the top. I will, in a, in a bit, uh, display um, our dashboard, uh, which links you to several further links uh, that are going to be uh, necessary for the next couple of sessions. So in a bit, there will be this uh, call for action button available again, which you can directly go to the Nano Commons powered uh, dashboard um, to have easy uh, access to information and links. Klaus, please start with your session. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so I've been asked to chair this session and, and lead in with giving an experience from Nanoface of how it was to go fair before the systems were really ready for it. Um, so Nanoface was a, how do I move the slide on, Martin? Uh, there we go. Okay. Um, so Nanophase was a fate-based um, project. It was one of the first to really deal with the fate of, of materials in terms of how they were changed going through the manufacturing process that you can see over here um, in the, in the left-hand side. And having to track things in time and across different processes, we had to look at what transformations happened in waste. We had to look at things that happened in time across different media and really the databases that were there weren't geared for that so we had to look around at different options for how we would record our data so we could share later we obviously knew knew we had to make it findable and available but there was nowhere that could really house it at that stage uh, next slide please martin if you can Oh, can I, I can do it here, got it. Um, so if we were looking in our waste management, instead of having a, a single form of nano that we did something to, and then we looked at some results, we actually had a single form of nano copper oxide that we put in a sewage works, simulated sewage works, and then looked at the change of it over time. So you can see the times go very fast, but that meant we had to be able to track different situations within our data sets as we went along. Um, it also had to be able to house model setups and tracking all the parameters that would go on within these model experiments. So some of those data would look like this, where you'd have um, earthworm uptakes of, of ions versus particles. Um, here you had an, a particle exposure, and you could see that uh, we had Exposure, con or con exposure over 28 days and then clean soils over 28 days. So the exposure situation was different for the organisms that were in there. And we then had to track what happened to forms over time. It wasn't just put it in, this was the form, this was the toxicity, uh, the toxicity output at the end of the experiment. Um, that meant we had to look into people that had done mesocosmic experiments before that we'd worked with, so people at Serenard and people at Saint, uh, who had this concept of the instance. So uh, you buy a nanoparticle, you have it from the manufacturer, it has a, had a set of properties, you then characterize it when it's arrived, and the system that you're going to keep it in, which was a, make it into a water, then put it into the suspensions for the experiment which is different chemistry so we'd have to characterize it again because the nanomaterials would have changed and then look at an exposure experiment where we would have to track it in time and look at different parameters over time so these instances became really important the way we had to to do that was create an instance where we measure everything we can. But then the next instance, we have a medium which has properties that needs recording. So that's part of the metadata. We then have to cover everything we can about the material now, which has more parameters on it than it did before. Uh, and then the next step is, you know, the next time point or another, another media part, the 
maybe the sediment or the organism. And again, you'd have to characterize the medium and the material within that stage. So for bigger experiments that obviously become more complex, uh, we end up with big schemes like this, which I'm sure Tassos has explained to some of you previously or, or will uh, at some point later when you need to use the data in trees. The thing we had to manage to make, make connect was that obviously this Nick C, which is the, um, uh, the, the database built in America, was built based on all the old existing ontologies. So there was as much comparability between the two, the European e Nanomapa system and the Nick from Saint uh, in America. We put all the nanophase, the Saint data, the Serenard data, and some of the IVM data in through the in through the NIC, which had the right structure, which then through Biomax and Nanomile was connected to other data within Nanocommons, which is then being fed into the Nanocommons knowledge portal, um, which we'll hear about later. The way we were going to then make it findable and accessible was is via the Nanophase clickable framework, which you can find on the Nanophase website. You basically click through, find find the exposure assessment framework. When you get there, you click on the knowledge base data at the bottom, uh, which then takes you onto a page that is on Tassos created. Um, click again on the on the data side in there, and you'll get to the piece about how we dealt with metadata, ontology, terminology, data capture template. I'd like to go on to this bit here. Uh, at the bottom, which, which if you scroll down, it looked like this. There's a, both a visual graphical manual to how we did it and a text-based manual. Um, this was created at a workshop in, in France where we had all the people from Serenade, uh, Nanophase and, and, and Saint there to try and put it together. It got put together by Christine Hendren um, in a company uh, called Helium. The main thing is that it takes time, it takes planning. You really have to have the resources in place. It doesn't take long to work out what you need to do, probably half an hour uh, to two hours when you sit down with the right person. In our case, that was Tassos. But then the time starts to build in terms of once you have to customize the Excel templates to work with the actual experiments, you're, you're looking at a day's work. But when you're trying to fill it out, you're looking at somebody who knows their experiment spending a good week trying to curate their data into the template and making sure it's right before it then gets checked by the curator and uploaded. So these timeframes really does need to be planned into, into projects uh, if, you, if you really wanna make your data fair, uh, as Thomas and, and Omar are gonna talk about later. So I think that's all I want to say as an intro. I think we'll take questions later and just hand straight over to Thomas. Uh, otherwise, we'll just end up answering the things he's going to talk about. Thank you very much. Um, so, Thomas, when you're ready. Can you hear me? Sorry. I can hear you, yeah. You cannot. I can. <laughs> I can, yes. Good. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Um, yeah, thanks the opportunity to continue on your nice presentation. I think that was a really nice introduction of why metadata is important and, and, and why we have to work on that. And also the time and the people have to be involved uh, or have to be involved in that. Um, therefore, I will just continue with what, what Klaus just um, said from my point of view, which is called, or we call now, the, the uh, data shepherd point of view and what that exactly means, uh, you will also hopefully see at the end. Um, there is a short survey, which I would li just like, as in the previous talks, create a, um, a word map. Um, you can reach that on the top and uh, on the bottom above. Um, uh, no, I think you see my point as yeah. well. You click out on the on the bar on the right hand side. Click on the next slide out there. Yeah, no, but just fill it in. I, I started with Ninchi to to just have it as a as a starting point. What that is, you also will see in a second. Um, what we want to do is to to share data. That that is what what 
the FAIR principles or the, the open science or open data initiative from, uh, from the EU and so on, that really this concept of, of being able to reuse data more often, uh, not just for the, the purpose they were actually created for, and for that there are coming a lot of more requirements on that, and this is especially metadata, and, uh, because the metadata will make data complete, or at least partly uh, more complete, which is probably not, not the concept, but um, but at least more usable. Yeah, and, and for that, you really have to think of what what really do you have to give to, um, or yeah give additionally to to the to the numbers that, that others can can uh, understand that this is already i think four years old yeah from a paper um where they looked at all these concept of completeness what does that really mean and i think completeness is really content specific yeah because data might be complete for for using in a specific content context but it might be just unusable in others and Th that is exactly the question. How can we make it as complete as possible, which means as many applications of the data are possible? Um, then this also relates to, to data quality clearly, yeah, because in principle there is sure you are doing the experiment and and you you try to do the high get the high highest quality out there. But in principle, if you then not report your data accordingly to, to standards, then uh, the best experimental quality is, is not sufficient because people will not be able to reuse it. Therefore, there is also a data, a, a data management quality you have to, to agree. Yeah? What, what are the standards you want your, your, your data to, to be shown? Um, this led to these fair principles and I won't don't go into into the the details of all that because Omar will do that later. The main point which I want to highlight light is this red um, arrow down there because that is the main mentioning of metadata. Yeah, and um, you have to see that the the fairness principles are guidelines, but they are not telling you what to do. Uh, they they tell you you should uh, do your your data according to standards, but we have to define that. And, and I think Klaus just showed a very nice example how these standards can be and have to be defined. Yeah, it's, it's work. Um, these were the, the original one. As I said, I will not go into these, but, but we also thought that because there is no really guidelines on, on the scientific side or the community side, what does it really mean that, that these are according to, to standards? Or how do you create these metadata standards? We said uh, we should look into that a little bit more detailed and, and create these scientific uh, fair principles, which are really more guidelines on what the community is needing to do. And this is um, just these links or the, the examples I have on here, but, but in principle, that is what I will talk about in the next couple of minutes. Now going to these Ninchi, and I just want to bring a little bit of a different uh, point of view on that. Most people think about metadata from their, their standpoint of, of um, data curation and, and bringing their data into, into the topic. But in principle, um, yes, yeah, sure, this, and, and see what you want to, to, to provide to your data. But I want to start with a little bit <laughs> different focus. We had this initiative that we wanted to create an identifier for a nanoparticle and a little bit more than just, okay, it's a titanium dioxide side, but it really has some kind of information on top of that, um, that you can distinguish between for example, one nanoform in a regulatory um, application and another. Yeah, and, and for doing that, we started a group of people starting to discuss all these points and people came up with ideas what is needed to really identify or identify a nanoparticle, um, di differentiate it from a nano, um, nano, other nanoparticle. And that should be all in this ninchi, in this uh, inchi for now. Uh, inchi, if you don't know the, the inchi, inchi is in principle an identifier, a chemical identifier for small molecules. Um, 
mainly organic molecules, but we, we said it has a nice concept which can be extended to one as well. Therefore, we, we decided to use the Ninchi or the Inchi and then extend it. But here are just these points, what people think is all needed for, for, for uh, really characterizing a, a nanoparticle. Yeah? And there are clearly chemical structures, overall composition, core composition, and so on, nanoparticles, charge, charge density, roughness. And when I saw this list, yeah, ligand identity around this, when I saw this list, then I was just thinking, are people really reporting that as metadata for their, 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 their experiments? Yeah, if they think this has to be even part of an identifier, then these, all these information should be at one point of time be, be um, am I out of time or somebody <laughs> changed my slide? Something happened to his presenter. We're seeing your slide. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Um, just to say, okay, in principle, all these things would have to be be, be presented as 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 metadata to an experiment, whatever experiment you are doing, because people think that this is important to identify a particle. Yeah, and and I'm agreeing that this is much too much, and therefore we decided on on a couple of case studies for different applications areas to boil that down that we come to an identifier at least, yeah, and a useful identifier which at least divides nanoparticle into groups of nanoparticles which can then be more specific and more specific by, by other metadata. Yeah, and this is what we said, okay, chemical composition, size, shape, these kind of things are clear. They should, they are really also defined in a regulatory um, setting as differentiating different nanoforms. Therefore, we said this is okay, nice to have would be surface composition, density, sur uh, structural defects, something like that. And then there are clearly things which are important, but which are beyond the scope of an identifier and perhaps in most cases even beyond the scope of a metadata which you assign to a data set because we most often don't know it. You know? Do we know all the magnetic properties? Probably not. Do we know the exact uh, oxidation state? Yeah, but if you have it, sure, this is important metadata, but if you don't have it, um, you can just not report it, and if that is part of an identifier, you cannot say, okay, is it not known? Is it just not defined or whatever? And therefore, I'm clearly saying, okay, this is beyond the, the Inchi concept. But also think about that people really decided or said that this is important to identify or to, to, to separate nanoparticles and therefore also results from the experiment. Okay, to get all these data, yeah, we uh, just showed, and I think we had a couple of other talks where we clearly showed why why these metadata is so important, and the coverage of, of that is important. Therefore, I'm now switching more to how do we get to this this data uh, uh, correlated metadata, yeah, and and this is something which I think uh, the nano phase is a nice example because uh, in principle. All these and, and Klaus said yes because there was not we were not at that point at the stage where this is, was all possible. But new projects don't have these excuses anymore. Yeah, there there are things, but it has to be directly integrated in the pro uh, project and done more or less from the day one. Yeah, and and all the partners have to be in principle uh, involved. If you just put that onto the the task of the data manager, your designated Meta, uh, data manager in the project, then this will not work. Yeah, it will just not work. You need to go back to the the data creators, then then the the analysts, and so on, and, and then also have some some data creators involved, which check what you put in, and so on. And this is time consuming. Yeah, Klaus talked about uh, seven days for for one data set. Yeah, this is this is a huge amount of effort, but I think it's worth to do this. Effort. Um, here, just another uh, view of, of this. <clears throat> yeah, people are involved in many, many of these tasks for, for getting really the data collected and then uploaded. And we have here this new rule 
as a shepherd who is really there to bring these people together and and try to to organize all these processes and and get people talk to each other have feedback loops that when 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 the curator doesn't find or thinks that a specific meta, uh, data point is missing that they then try to to get that from the data curators uh, uh, or the analysts um, <clears throat> again here just this instance map i think we had that already therefore i can jump over that <clears throat> just to say okay most of the time we still organize that in in excel sheets um that's definitely a, a way to go because people are also used to to excel sheets but i also want to use some time to to think about where can we go further now yeah, for the nanoinformatics there are similar things than what we just saw for fate yeah that that there are specific already agreed um uh, templates yeah the moda is for for simulation of for example membranes and so on, uh, interaction with nanoparticles with membranes or uh, proteins with, uh, with nanoparticles and so on. And then for the QSAR type of modeling, we have these QMRFs, uh, which are really just some way to report that. But what you see here is that most of these things are very much free text. Uh, they are just connecting things together and, and people just write in there, which makes it very hard to, to then extract that. Yeah, the material here is somewhere in the user case. Yeah, you have there the material sense. Um, therefore, if you want to go further, there was this idea which we had in, in Ace Nano of a questionnaire. Yeah, where where these things are really more organized in a in a, in a yeah in a structured way that the the size distribution and so on are really an an, an kind of defined way to report that. For example also then on the experimental setup, the machinery you are using and so on. And this is what we had here, yeah, that you really have a web interface where all these things are um, uh, put in. You can then annotate that and so on and, and get this structure and then have also ways to, to communicate or to, to extract this data easier and then compare it with other data sets in the, in the data web. You can then also, or again, back to the workflow, how you get this in. It's also clear that, that we want to, that because it is so much uh, work, we also have to support that technically. And, and there are ways to get a lot of metadata from, from example, the, your, your, out, uh, your, your standard output files from the instruments and so on, and, and try to collect that also in a more automatic way and not have you all type in or copy paste it from other phones. Um, finally, why do we do that? Yeah, or I, I think I already touched that point. Yeah, the idea is really that we have these different projects, all these produce data, and we want to find, in principle, all the data from all these projects, and therefore uh, the idea of, of having linked metadata or metadata based uh, linkage between the data warehouses and then have one common search interface where all these things can go in and and you just type that um, okay I'm running out of time or <laughs> at least people are reminding me that I might run out of time uh, just to let you know that that we hope that at one point of time we have these different warehouses which are really optimized and the metadata which is covered there is optimized for very specific specific areas like first chem characterization or hazard or fade or whatever um, but then you have this overlaying infrastructure which then really combines these different data sets and in that way brings you an overall view on, on a specific nanoparticle. Good. Um, this all, and I already mentioned, that has to be uh, supported by ontologies to make these links between these data warehouses. But there is another short presentation uh, later where we will go into these, um, into into ontologies a little bit more. Important is that these ontologies also help to 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 get the people understand each other because creators and data managers and customers might have very different uh, um, 
understanding of very of one specific um, term, and this is just instant here as an example. I often use uh, um, endpoint as an example because they really mean different things, and these ontologies also help us to to understand what the other person thinks about a specific term. And if we are not agreeing on this terminology, then we might have to do something else. But but that's later. As well. Finally, uh, this slide is a summary. Um, when is metadata complete? Uh, the question is, can it be complete? Yeah, because it uh, started with, you have all these different applications and different application meet um, different metadata. And it's also such a huge effort to, to support all that. Yeah, but in principle, we can start with standards like, for example, the one defined by Nanophase. Um, we should improve them over time yeah, because the experiments become better, but we also see more and more applications of this data. And therefore, we should think about do we need to capture more metadata in the future? Um, and we want to really support that with, with new technology. Yeah, and as I, uh, this, again, this, this table here from this paper, I think it's very important that you understand that this is really an effort all of us have to do, and therefore just um, this advertisement for the um, uh, for the working F. At the moment, it's really mainly um, data managers in there um, and ontology developers, but I think it, it becomes more and more important that also the creators, the analysts, the curators are coming in. And, and we have some shepherds and we want to look for more shepherds who then take care of organizing that with these different groups. That's it. Um, if I have a couple of minutes and I will just try to share my screen quickly. Um, how can I share my screen? Screen sharing because then we can see if somebody filled something in. No, not yet, <laughs> but I keep that open. I hope that it works, but if you have some metadata which I missed, which you think is so important that you want to, to mention that, please go in, fill there some metadata fields. You can also start with size and something like that. But just as if if I missed something, if you have a very specific field you want to put something in, I would be happy to see uh, more metadata fields which you see as missing in most of the of the data sets yeah if you if you just experience that you would always like to see something specifically and you never found it in, in publications or in, in data entries and databases just fill that in into this meti uh, uh survey thank you excellent thank you very much thomas thanks for keeping to time uh there are no questions in the chat so far, but I'm sure they'll turn up as soon as the mask starts speaking. So I'll let you field them, field them in text. Um, I think the, <clears throat> the experience we had from, from Nanophase is you need, you really do need to think about this stuff, as you say, up ahead of the project. You know, you, otherwise you'll run out of Tassos, um, which, which we, luckily didn't do but i would have liked to not abuse tassos as much as we did um he's he's one of the people that whenever we meet him everybody feels like they need to buy him a beer because it it was too hard work in nanophase um so i would really suggest to people to read through the manual or or talk uh to people like thomas and tassos and our plan it in from the start don't 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 try and do it as you move along, it has to be planned in. Okay, um, I think if a Mars slides are ready, Martin, we'll we'll keep the time and then we'll see what time there is for a bit of discussion at the end. Thank you very much. I saw you show your camera earlier, Mar. I don't know whether you just want to check that sound is all right. Yes, I am here. Thank you. Do you hear me? Yeah, perfectly. Thank you. All Great. yours. Yeah. Welcome all uh, to the Nano Safety Cluster Education Day. Uh, in this session, I will be talking about, uh, first, my name is Amar Mar. I am a PhD student at the Department of Bioinformatics at Maastricht University, the Netherlands. In this session, I will be talking about uh, how to implement uh, scient the scientific FAIR principles uh, in your work or my work. And uh, FAIR is an acronym for four words, 
uh, findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. And uh, this is uh, guiding, these are guiding principles that were uh, defined uh, and introduced so uh, the scientific research output can be used, can be reused, and can be uh, 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 maximally benefited of. So, why do we need FAIR? Uh, in scientific research, data sharing and reuse are beneficial for time efficiency and increased productivity. Uh, so instead of keep keeping repeating uh, the same experiments in different institutions uh, and reinventing the wheel, we can, if we shared our data in a fair way, we can reuse this data, we can uh, embed it uh, or integrate it with an, another systems through interoperable uh, software and so on. But for now, the data reuse remains difficult, and that's due to the lack of infrastructure, standards, and policies that should be adopted uh, w w widely around the globe so we can make benefit of, of uh, this data and reuse it. And the FAIR principles aims to provide guidance uh, to increase the data discovery and reuse. Since those principles are more like verbally defined, they're not te technically defined, uh, the fairness of a data set, uh, even though the fairness of a data set can be assessed using something called maturity indicators, which, uh, which I will be talking about in a, in a moment. Uh, so these are the four uh, fair principles, findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. And each one of, if, of them, there is uh, more sub-principles, sub in total 15 principles. So in findability, we focus on uh, identifying your work, uh, uh, providing metadata, and indexing the data and repositories. For accessibility, it's about using standardized protocols like HTTP protocols uh, uh, and, and also uh, authentication when necessary and making sure the data is always there. Interoper interoperability, that means the ability of integrate data sets from different resources. And that, uh, for, to do that, we should use like a shared language. It's called controlled vocabularies uh, and make sure these uh, vocabularies are also fair. And uh, so we can link the data uh, through their metadata. Reusability uh, is about more defining a license for using your, your, uh, for your uh, data sets. So to define how others can use it, the provenance, who made this data and when it was published and by whom, and also adopting the community standards for each one of those um, uh, protocols. So how to be fair in your work? There is several points I would, I would like to go into, and each one of those uh, points uh, should be adopted by researchers when they start designing an experiment or producing a data set, either from a computational approach or experimental uh, uh, practice approach. The first thing is once you have a data set, you have to put it online. So it's more advisable to put this data in, in a specialized uh, research repository that makes sure this data is, um, uh, uh, is exposed in, in a fair way to the world. Uh, while putting it on a personal website or, or a website that doesn't follow the standards makes it very hard to reach by other researchers and, and people around the world. So research repositories, it's like um, a database of data sets and they provide several uh, policies, several policies um, and they also define clear uh, clear uh, uh, clear terms for use and also they sh they also uh, the research data repository provides open restricted or closed access to the data depending on their policies uh, the usage license is also provided by the repository and also the the repositories use persistent identifiers uh, to make your data persistent unique and citable which is very important uh, as important as in your journal uh, articles when you want to cite other people's work. Also for your data sets, when you use it, it should be ID identifiable, uniquely identified, uh, so you can cite it. And uh, also the research data repositories are usually certified or supports a, a repository standard. This is about data repository, which is you deposit your data sets in. But the data repository itself, it should be assessed 
for its fairness and for its compliance with all the criteria uh, of the fair principles. And that's where we, when we have uh, data registries. So a data registry is provide information about repositories, not about the data sets, but about the repository itself or the database itself for permanent storage and access of the data sets in it. Uh, so researchers, funding bodies and publish and publishers uh, can access and make use of this data. And I will give an example here. It's one of the data registries called re3data.org. Uh, it contains numerous data sets in many different uh, disciplines of sciences and uh, this registry when you submit your uh, uh, repository to this registry it's get being reviewed and assessed for similar criteria like uh, the information that it provides the accessibility uh, is it open or restricted or closed? The licenses they provide, is it open source or how can it be reused? Which kind of persistent identifiers it, um, it provides, uh, the certificates and standards and policies. And once, once your uh, data repository or database is being uh, uh, reviewed or accredited or accepted, uh, you can also generate for your data repository a badge like this this is an example for the eNanoMapper database which uh, uh, you can see this is the badge for uh, for this entry in the re3 data repository there is a permanent identifier for this uh, repository and here you can see the criteria that are fulfilled by by this repository and so we see how data registries can be used to assess and to provide it's it's a it's a good way when you want to put your data set in a certain repository is to go to such registries and search for the repositories that fulfill the, uh, the, the criteria that you prefer for your data. So it's a simple uh, decision tree when you have your data first you ask the question, what type of data do you have? Is it a data set? Then you, dip, you deposit that in a data repository. Or, and if it's a database, you're making a database or repository, which is a collection of other data sets, then you have to register that in a data registry. Uh, this is for the first point I want to talk about, about data repositories and registries. The second point is metadata and controlled vocabularies. And high quality metadata improved data discovery because if you put your data sets like an Excel sheet or small access file uh, on the internet without any information about it, it will be hard to be reused. It will be hard to be interpreted and uh, and and uh, being incorporated in other people's research. So it's very important to provide metadata about your work. Uh, and controlled vocabularies, it's like a set of terms that uh, or fields or properties that can uniquely uh, uh, identify your data and which increase the chance to be discovered uh, by uh, user searches over the web. And metadata schemas, it's a sort of controlled vocabulary, but for the web, uh, made for the web. So when you mark your data set with, with a metadata schema, you can make your data findable to the world. One of the widely adopted schemas, it's uh, schema.org, uh, and this is adopted by Google and the major search engines. It has an extension for the life sciences domain called bioschemas.org, and uh, uh, you annotate your, the page where you upload your data set with this schema uh, on your personal website or institute website, which makes it much easier to be picked up by the Google data set search and also to uh, extract this metadata from it automatically and, and increase uh, or boost the discovery of your data set. The third thing we will talk about is permanent identifiers. So. Uh, Usually, you, people use a link to their data set, uh, to the page where they put it. And this, uh, it's important to notice that web links can break. Websites are, are not uh, guaranteed to be online for, for, for long terms. And the tracking down the data based on a general description can be challenging. So sometimes if you, if you wrote uh, a natural language query in Google, it's very hard to, uh, uh, to get the data set that you're really targeting. So you need something that is more uniquely identified this data and you can access it uh, permanently and, and directly. And the solution for that is permanent identifiers. 
And uh, there is several uh, kinds of identifiers implemented. One of them is DOI, and I think all of you recognize that. This is coming from is the same identifier used by journal art articles, where your publications and articles are given a DOI identifier. And, and, and this is a permanent identifier that guarantees every time you click on the URL of that article, it will take you to the uh, uh, publication uh, website or, or the material itself. The same for data sets, also they can be given a, a DOI identifier. The structure here, there's an example of the structure of the identifier it composed, it's a URL, so it's accessible through any web browser. Uh, through the HTTP protocol. It's composed of three sections. The first part is the DOI directory. The second part is the prefix and mostly related to the uh, uh, publishing uh, side. And the suffix is about the, 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 uh, uh, the targeted or the, the data set or the article that is being identified. On the other hand, ORCID is uh, is a different kind of identifiers. I will I will come to that in a moment. And the benefits of having uh, this permanent identifier is keeping track of the data and making sure this data does not get lost or identified. For example, having uh, two data sets with similar titles or uh, published by the same author, but with, with certain um, uh, enhancements or modifications. So having a unique identifier is makes sure that this data is not uh, uh, misidentified and it has permanent access to this material. And also it's easier to cite and track the impact of the data sets uh, the same way that journal articles are. So you want, if you want to incorporate other people's data sets in your research, you also you need these uh, identifiers to cite their work and keep track on the impact that of your, of your own data sets. So the other kind of data of identifiers is called ORCID ID, and this is for the researcher side. So we're not talking about identifying the article and 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 uh, the data set, but here we are talking about identifying the researcher himself or herself. So this is also a URL based identifier. It's global. It's unique to every researcher. Uh, anybody can sign up for this uh, for this identifier ORCID ID, and it has been used to link the researchers to several things like universities and institutions, funding agencies, other kinds of identifiers like the researcher ID and the pub loans, and also uh, uh, for for the networks for researchers like ResearchGate and Mendeley. Uh, and other repositories like Figshare and Zenodo. So with this unique ORCID identifier, you can be linked through all your uh, publication journals for your uh, institution and uh, other networks, and which is, makes it easy to track uh, the impact of the researcher, his scientific output, uh, and, and all the, the achievements he, uh, he or, or she does in their life career. Uh, so for permanent identifiers, those are the two important things that are recommended to, to keep in mind and use as much as possible your own identifier as a researcher and uh, for each data set, give it a permanent identifier. And usually when you choose a repository to deposit your data sets, these repositories take care of giving permanent identifiers. 10 minutes left, Amar. Yes. Yeah, for the for the fourth point, I want to talk about its data formats. So when you uh, having uh, your output uh, data output in well structured and well organized way, uh, this is makes it uh, to be easy, much easier to be reused, and it makes it inter interoperable. That means uh, softwares can parse this data and and integrate it with other data sets coming from other places, and. Uh, as many of you know, in the life sciences domain, researchers capture their data in spreadsheets. Spreadsheets and also spreadsheets can be, uh, there is uh, several guidelines to how to make your spreadsheets fair. I will give some examples. Um, so for example, it's important to have a persistent uh, way of encoding empty values. And it's uh, recommended to use a value for that, like an NA, which will be recognized by programming languages like R or a NAN for non-available, but not to use empty empty uh, cells in Excel. Another example also, also, it's important to keep each value in your data set in a separate column and not use columns with combined 
combined values like here core size and surface charge in one column and and the data is uh, separated by a comma but you should put every value in its own column a third column a third uh, best practices for spreadsheets is to use consistent uh, date format and it's better to use one uh, like uh, widely used formats like uh, this one for the year as four digits the month as two digits and the day as two digits and not using different um, formats or uh, unknown formats that would be hard to be parsed by uh, pro uh, softwares Another example is when you want to annotate your data with a certain feature like increase or decrease, for example, differentially expressed genes or uh, physiochemical properties, avoid uh, doing uh, uh, coloring or, or, or putting the data in a specific place on the sheet to indicate certain meaning, but always encode all the, the properties in the same cell. So here, instead of coloring with green for increase and red for decrease, we use a plus or, si or, or minus signs. And these are practices should be adopted by researchers when they produce their data as spreadsheets. Also, be, uh, uh, not, it's not enough also to put your data in a table, but you have to provide the metadata to describe that uh, tabular format. And this is called data dictionary. And data dictionary, it helps documenting your model. So uh, for example, you have to, in this data dictionary, you list all the columns names used in the data spreadsheet, as we see here. In the, in the figure and you provide a description for each one of the, the purpose of these columns the data type they provide is it an integer a date a floating point value or just a string and also you have to give an indication of the units of measurements because when people want to integrate this data with other data sets if you do not give uh, specific units to your numbers it will be hard to incorporate it in in future research and the fourth point is to describe the measures that have been taken to ensure the correctness uh, and the consistency of data, like the platform uh, where the experiment has been conducted, how many repeats, and so on. Licensing is the fifth point in this uh, about uh, making data fair and data citation. So you should give your data license where uh, the license describes the conditions under which your data so or software is reusable. So, uh, and if you are interested in open licenses, you can check the creativecommons.org website where it provides uh, several licenses and you can choose what suits your data set. And also uh, state how to cite your data. So uh, always provide information about the author, the creator, the date of publication, and the, the organization where the data set was produced, plus the unique identifier. Uh, also, it's important to notice that long-term data stewardship is an important factor for keeping data open and accessible for longer term. The sixth point we come to is as we saw before, fair principles are uh, are are verbal uh, are verbally addressed. They do not have any technical implementation uh, or technical requirements, and uh, data reusability in the life sciences domain is hard to quantify. The fair assessment usually is mostly done manually, so you submit your data set to a certain uh, uh, service or, or third party that does this assessment. It happens manually, which makes it uh, slow and less objective. And we lack also the means of comparing fairness uh, of the life sciences data in a visual, easy to read manner. And that's why indi maturity indicators came to the, to the picture as a, a way of uh, assessing the fairness of a data set in, in, in a programmatically implemented, implemented way, uh, either automatic or semi-automatic as much as possible. And recently, uh, a group I have done with several colleagues uh, at Maastricht University is about creating uh, that, uh, creating a workflow, uh, uh, a semi-automated one for fair maturity indicators in the life sciences. So it's uh, it's a Jupyter notebook. It's a workflow implemented through Jupyter notebooks in Python programming language uh, that can assess the the fairness of a data repository available on the internet. That, can, that means it can be accessed through the URL uh, uh, and following the, all, all the, the, the sub principles of the, of the FAIR principles. Here, there is a GitHub link uh, to, to see the output of that uh, uh, research. And here is the DOI and the title of the article published in Nanomaterials. Five, and this, 
Yes. In this research, we took five, uh, six uh, data sets or databases on the internet with use cases like searching for titanium dioxide uh, toxicity in, in, in nanomapper or other three uh, nanomaterials related databases. And then uh, we implemented this uh, easy to read uh, balloon uh, 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 plot to see for each one of the fair maturity indicators how well it performed or how well, uh, how much is it fair. So the size of the shape indicates the level, the score of fairness, the color is the, for the four principle, the principles and the shape if it's automatic, manual or not assist. And we can see here that the Kimball database for chemicals achieved the highest, uh, relatively the highest fairness level, while, while uh, gene expression omnibus and nanocommons achieved a relatively low fairness. So the output of the research uh, also provided a way of uh, visualizing uh, fair maturity, fair assessment through maturity indicators. Our current work is uh, about developing new maturity indicators. Uh, since we are more, uh, I am more um, specialized in working with uh, nano safety data and nano QSAR applications. So we want to develop new maturity indicators for uh, these applications, especially for the reusability and interoperability principles. Uh, so we will, uh, I am developing a maturity indicator about standardized formats like IOM, GRC and ISATAP and minimal reporting standards uh, that should be met in the assist data sets. Also after reviewing 15 nano QSAR article reviews, we saw several uh, observations that could be implemented as maturity indicators, like having at least three descriptors uh, uh, to be used in a QSAR study and uh, uh, making sure that the units are always reported so the data set can be reused for QSAR applications and also uh, frequent physiochemical features uh, were used also to, to, to make sure these uh, physiochemical uh, descriptors are always uh, present in the data sets uh, for reusability. So, in conclusion, uh, we see that implementing fair principles in our daily work is crucial to enable data discovery and reusability. We saw that um, uh, making our data set software and workflows fair is as important as our articles and publications. Uh, there is many options as we saw. There is many tools, standards, websites. Uh, so pick up what benefits you the most. There is no right and wrong here. Just uh, try to make sure to implement those uh, those uh, main principles. And fairness, as we saw, can be measured. And we developed a semi-automated workflow to assess the fairness. And we applied it to six life sciences resources using maturity indicators. And such workflow could help the developers of the databases to improve their fairness. And uh, these workflows can be easily extended uh, because uh, Jupyter Notebooks are easily can be extended to fit your own uh, resource that you want to assess its fairness. I would like to acknowledge uh, my my colleagues and co-authors of the uh, of the project and the published article and the RISCO NanoSolvit Government for Nano and Nano Safety Clusters. Uh, EU projects. And thank you for listening. Excellent. Excellent. Thank, thank you very, very much, much Omar. Yeah, thank you. I'm hoping thank everybody's you. clapping away in their virtual world. Yeah. This was really good. It was nice to see how to do it. Um, yeah. It, it's easy to talk about that we all should do it, but it's nice to see what the actual tools are. And, and you'll see that in the chat as well, that everybody finds it really useful. So thank you very much. Yeah, very good. Um, we have one minute for a quick question, but I can't find one that's sitting there they're mostly complimentary to you for a very good presentation so um i think uh in the interest of time uh, i would like to thank the speakers that we've had here thomas and amar it's really good to see that it has moved on a, a lot from when we started nanophase and you can plan this in now I think I would encourage people to go and, and look in the dashboard for the active links that are there and feedback to, to Thomas and others on the exercises that are sat in the dashboard. Um, and then I'll hand back to you, Martin. Yeah. Be one final question still to be answered by Amar. We just put it on the um,
Okay, Omar, do you do you want to respond to this? That's on the screen. Actually, you're referring to this question also throughout your talk shortly. Yes, actually, anyone can place this data in a repository. Uh, most likely, it will be go, go through a, a review process uh, to check for 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 certain uh, like criteria. But this, yes, this is this is possible. Just go to re3data.org and pick up the repository from your field or discipline and submit your data there. Usually they have a link on their website for data submission and the guidelines to uh, to make your data uh, uh, comply with, with their criteria. Yes. Maybe you can also comment a little bit on how can we support people in doing that? Um, Actually, we, we can pro provide materials like uh, links to, uh, to to repositories and, and services that provide that, yes. Well, thanks a lot, Klaus. Thank thanks a lot, Thomas. Thanks a lot, Amar, for this insight into data. This is our data workshop, Getting Data Fair. This is, I guess, one of the most important things in this era that we are now, that our data is are not just getting into papers. This is always nice, but we need complete data sets with complete metadata sets that people can also reuse this data. There has lots of has been a lot uh, a big investment into data by the European Commission uh, throughout the past two decades, and we need to get this data into repositories that we can much we can get much more out of them. And people prediction using prediction and developing uh, prediction software can 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 work on these. Um, we have a couple of minutes uh, break, uh, three minutes on my watch um, to continue then with um, some e tools. And we are now getting further from the data to the tools that uh, can use such data of other people and reuse and get a better impact even out of that such data in the next uh, session number four. So we'll quickly upload the slides uh, of the presenters. Many of them are going to showcase some of the tools. So getting us really insight into by clicking into the tools on how they operate the systems. Get some fresh air into the head and make ourselves ready for the last um, morning session before the General Assembly, which is a working lunch 